Access your free language gifts of the month right now. Here's what you're getting this month. First, the making a phone call cheat sheet. Want to be able to talk on the phone in your target language? Then this conversation cheat sheet will help you do just that. You'll learn all the basic phrases, questions, and answers you'll need when making a call. Second, want to know the learning hacks, motivational tips, and success strategies for learning a language in 2020? Then you'll want this exclusive 52-page ebook. Download it now for free before we take it down. Third, words and phrases for the dentist. Learn how to schedule a checkup, talk about a toothache, and much more with this one-minute vocab lesson. Fourth, can you talk about your zodiac sign? Then this next one minute lesson is for you if you wanna learn. You'll learn how to say the 12 signs in your target language. Fifth, the 32 words you'll need for language learning. Noun, verb, adjective, sentence, grammar. Can you say these in your target language? If not, you'll want this quick one minute lesson. Sixth, free audiobooks for our members only. Unlock our huge library of language learning audiobooks. Save them to your device and listen and learn. They're yours to keep forever. And finally, the deal of the month. If you want to finally master the language with lessons by real teachers and our complete language learning program, take the 12 month challenge and get 12 months of premium or premium plus at up to 45% off. So to get your gifts and language learning resources, click the link in the description below. Download them right now before they expire. Now, let's take a look at some conversational phrases. Listen to the dialogue. Wat doe je voor werk? Ik ben een kunstenaar. Listen to it again, now with the English translation. Wat doe je voor werk? What do you do? Ik ben een kunstenaar. I'm an artist. First of all, you need to learn how to say, What do you do? That's, Wat doe je voor werk? Listen to it again. Wat doe je voor werk? Wat doe je voor werk? Now, how do you answer this question? This is the pattern you'll need. Ik ben een, Your occupation. I'm a, an, your occupation. For example, I'm an artist. Ik ben een kunstenaar. Ik ben een kunstenaar. Here are a few more professions you can use with the same pattern. Police officer. Politieagent. Politieagent. Politieagenten. Politieagenten. Teacher. Leraar. Leraar. Lerares. Lerares. Doctor. Dokter. Dokter. Engineer. Ingenieur. Ingenieur. Now, listen to some examples. Wat doe je voor werk? Ik ben een leraar. Wat doe je voor werk? Ik ben een dokter. Wat doe je voor werk? Ik ben een ingenieur. Okay, now it's your turn. Do you remember how to say, what do you do? Wat doe je voor werk? Imagine you're a doctor. Do you remember how to say, doctor? Dokter. Dokter. Say, I'm a doctor. Ik ben een dokter. 
Now answer the question saying that you are a doctor. Wat doe je voor werk? Ik ben een dokter. Now, imagine you're a teacher. Do you remember how to say teacher? Leraar. Leraar. Say, I'm a teacher. Ik ben een leraar. Now, answer the question saying that you are a teacher. Wat doe je voor werk? Ik ben een leraar. Now, imagine you're an engineer. Do you remember how to say engineer? Ingenieur. Ingenieur. Say, I'm an engineer. Ik ben een ingenieur. Now, answer the question saying that you are an engineer. Wat doe je voor werk? Ik ben een ingenieur. Well done! In this lesson, you learn new occupation-related vocabulary and phrases you can use in your everyday life. You are now able to talk about your job like a native speaker. In this video, you'll have a chance to test them out with a quiz. First, you'll see an image and hear a question. Next comes a short dialogue. Listen carefully and see if you can answer correctly. We'll show you the answer at the end. Are you ready? Een leraar is aan het praten met zijn leerlingen. Wat gaan de leerlingen meenemen? Morgen gaan we naar het museum. Neem met je mee een pen, een schrift en iets om te drinken. Je hoeft geen boterhammen mee te nemen, want we gaan lunchen in het restaurant van het museum. En een paraplu? Het kan gaan regenen. Neem er alsjeblieft eentje mee. Oké. Okay. Wat gaan de leerlingen meenemen? Een leraar is aan het praten met zijn leerlingen. Wat gaan de leerlingen meenemen? Morgen gaan we naar het museum. Neem met je mee een pen, een schrift en iets om te drinken. Je hoeft geen boterhammen mee te nemen, want we gaan lunchen in het restaurant van het museum. En een paraplu? Het kan gaan regenen. Neem er alsjeblieft eentje mee. Oké. Okay. How similar are Dutch and German really? Hallo, mijn naam is Ernst. Hallo, my name is Ernst. In this lesson, I will compare the Dutch language with the German language. But first... If you want to learn and speak Dutch in the fastest, easiest and most fun way, then get your free lifetime account at dutchpod101.com right now. Start speaking Dutch in minutes with our audio and video lessons by real teachers. In the very first minute of the lesson, you learn a basic conversation. Okay, back to the lesson. I will introduce a bit of the historical development of Dutch and German. Then, I'll give some background information on how the pronunciation of the languages grew apart. After that, I will go deeper into specific differences between Dutch and German. The first specific difference I will be discussing is the spelling and cases. The second specific difference I will be discussing is related to grammar. Before we jump in, a small disclaimer. I am fluent in German, but while learning German, I didn't quite get rid of my Dutch accent. So German audience, I'm sorry for butchering the pronunciation. Let's jump in. In ye good old times, around the time of the Roman Empire, the Proto-Germanic language was spread out north of the Roman Empire. Because when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Which, in this case, meant speaking Latin instead of the barbaric, Proto-Germanic. 
north of the Roman border, so in Austria, Germany, the Netherlands, Denmark, and in part of Scandinavia, Proto-Germanic was the most important language. To the west, the Slavic and Uralic language sphere was situated. This is Finland, Poland, Hungary, down to the Balkans and east towards Russia. Now you know where the Proto-Germanic language sphere was located. So let's fast forward right to around the fall of the West Roman Empire. Around the fall of Rome is when the High German consonant shift slowly started to happen. This means that over the course of many generations the language changed. It took roughly three to four hundred years. However, the High German consonant shift did not happen in Low German and Dutch. Low German? Where did that come from? Let me explain. Because of the standardization of German, Low German slowly became a dialect after the High German consonant shift took place. The High German became the standard German. Low German is still spoken in the northern part of Germany, but the amount of speakers is dwindling. Just to clarify something about High German to avoid confusion. High German is called High German because it was spoken in the German Alps, up high. In German it's called Hochdeutsch, which is also translated as Standard German. This may lead to some confusion, so make sure you have the right Hochdeutsch in mind when reading something on this subject. Low German is called Low German because it was spoken in the lowlands of Germany. To avoid confusion, in Germany they sometimes say Old High German to clarify which German they're talking about. Alright, the consonant shift takes place in four phases. Another three shifts happen which officially aren't categorized. Let's walk through them. The first phase saw three changes. The first one being that words ending with a P sound change to a F sound. Let's look at the word ape as an example. In Dutch it's aap and in German it's affe. The second change was that the final T at the end of a word became a S or Z sound. To illustrate this, let's look at the word white. In Dutch, it's wit, and in German, it's weiss. The third change was when the letter K was replaced with a ch sound. Take, for example, the word belly. In Dutch, it's buik, and in German, bauch. The second phase saw two changes. The first one being where the P sound became a F sound. The word horse illustrates this point perfectly. In Dutch it's paard and in German it's pferd. The second change was with the letter T when it's not at the end of a word. It became a Z or Z sound. For example, the word tooth. In Dutch, it's tand, and in German, it's zahn. In the southern Austro-Bavarian dialects, a third shift happened, but this one is not found in standard German, so that's a topic for another time. The third phase saw only one shift that affected standard German. The D sound at the beginning of a word became a T sound. Look at the word parts. In Dutch it's deel and in German it's teil. Two other shifts happened, but they were restricted to Swiss German and some Austro-Bavarian dialects. Let's keep moving. Whether the fourth phase is officially part of the High German consonant shift is a debate as one part also affected Low German and Dutch. This is the opposite of the first three phases, which solely affected High German. 
The three shifts include the th becomes a d. This shift also happens in Dutch and not in English. So bath in Dutch is bad and in German it's bad. The last three shifts happen somewhere sometime along or after the high German consonant shift. The first one is like the other shifts mentioned before. The other two only concern the pronunciation of letters. The first one is that the th or v sound becomes a b sound. This can be seen in the word love. In Dutch it's liefde and in German it's liebe. The second shift, purely in pronunciation, is the G sound. In High German, they used to pronounce the G as in Dutch. The signature G sound. As Dutch was unaffected by this change, we still pronounce the words in the good old way. Take for example the verb to give. In Dutch we say geven and in German it's geben. The last one is that the S and the Z are pronounced as SH. Take for example the word weak. In Dutch it's zwak and in German it's schwach. The last one does get a bit vague as in Dutch we also know the SH sound. Take for example the word shield. In Dutch it's schild and in German it's schild. As I mentioned before, these changes started right from around the fall of the West Roman Empire and continued until somewhere in the 9th century, as then German was written down in books. This caused a degree of standardization of Old High German, which later became the Standard German. And that wraps up the phases. Having this shift in mind, you can see why German and Dutch are over 80% similar. Don't think that every word is similar though. There are a lot of false friends. The word winkel is such a false friend. If I say in Dutch, ik ga naar de winkel, I say, I am going to the store. If I were to literally translate that in German, it's something along the lines of Ich gehe zum Winkel. That will leave the average German puzzled. That is because in German, Winkel means angle. And if you're saying you're going to the angle, that probably would raise some questions. So, you may be wondering what the other differences are. Because of the high German consonant shift, a lot of words are spelled differently. This is not where it stops, however, because German and Dutch spelling rules continue to differ on various other aspects. Here are three examples where spelling rules differ. The first one, the spelling rules for capital letters. Generally speaking, Dutch follow the same spelling rules as English, with the exception of months and days of the week. They're not capitalized in Dutch. German, on the other hand, capitalizes each and every noun. A second one is that in Dutch, non loan words never end with a double letter. For example, the verb to want in German is spelled as W I L L, while in Dutch it's spelled as W I L. Only one L. The third one is about plurals. Plurals are easy in Dutch. They either end in EN or with a S. In German, it's just a bit harder to grasp as nouns are declined in various different endings. And the rules are harder to learn. Having three genders does not make it any easier. Does that mean that spelling rules in Dutch are way easier? Sadly, it does not. It is sometimes joked that Dutch spelling rules have an exception to the exception of the exception of the exception of the main rule. This partly has to do with the taal unie. 
This is an organization created by the Dutch and Belgium government to govern the spelling of the Dutch language. In the Netherlands, the Taaluni is the only organization that can change the official spelling rules that is used by the government and is taught in schools. This high degree of standardization means that sometimes awkward spelling of words remain in place for a very long time. Before we move on with differences in grammar, I'll mention a funny thing both languages have in common. Nouns are written together, no spaces. This leads to monster words in Dutch like Kindercarnavalsoptochtvoorbereiding werkzaamheden, comitéleden. That's one Dutch word for children's carnival parade preparation committee members. Or in German, they have the word Rindfleischetakierungsüberwachungsaufgabenübertragungsgesetz. That's the German word for a law to delegate monitoring of veal labeling. Just as a side note, you won't find these words in a dictionary as no one normally uses this word. They remain grammatically correct though. That being said, let's move on to grammar. When it concerns articles, Dutch only has two genders. This is still harder than the English with their the but still much easier than the many different ones German have. There's also one indefinite article which is easy to remember. In Dutch, it's een. The negative indefinite article is always geen, always. The first gender is the common gender, either masculine or feminine. This group is known as the nouns. For example, de boom. This means the tree. As trees have the masculine gender in Dutch, it's a de noun. The second gender is neuter, known as het nouns. For example, het huis. This means the house. As houses have the neuter gender in Dutch, it is a het noun. There's one exception to nouns not having three genders. This is when referring back to nouns using the possessive. Then gender does play a role. I'll illustrate that with the following example. De raad beslist. Haar beslissing werd goed ontvangen. This literally translates to the council decides. Her decision was well received. Because Dutch only knows two genders, this means that Dutch has no cases. It's always de or het. Even with plural, we simply use de for that. No more der, die, oder, das. Prepositions don't change a single thing. This does make life easier, as Germans sometimes don't even agree amongst themselves what gender should be assigned to a specific word. Take the word butter as an example. The southern Bundesländer and much of Switzerland and part of Austria say butter is masculine. The rest of the German-speaking population use it as a feminine word. As Dutch and German have the same ancestor language, this means that Dutch used to have cases so one can sometimes pop up in old expressions or names. For example, the official name for the Netherlands in Dutch is Koninkrijk der Nederlanden. Translates to Kingdom of the Netherlands. Leaving gender and case behind us, let's talk about another grammatical point. Word order. The basic word order for Dutch and German and a bunch of other languages is subject, verb, object. In Dutch and German, however, we have something peculiar going on, and this is known as the subject, verb, object, verb order in more complex sentences. 
This is also known as the V2 word order. Let me illustrate this with an example. I am going to learn something about the differences between Dutch and German today. In Dutch that would be Ik ga vandaag wat over de verschillen tussen Nederlands en Duits leren. In German it would be Heute werde ich etwas über den Unterschied zwischen Niederländisch und Deutsch lernen. Those are very long sentences, so I'll break them down to make it easier to understand. In English, all the verbs are at the beginning of this sentence. I am going to learn dot dot dot. In Dutch and German, only the conjugated word gaan in Dutch or werden in German is at the beginning of the sentence. The infinitive leren in Dutch or lernen in German is the, at the end of the sentence. This is something typical of Dutch and German. The exact word order of the V2 position is slightly different between Dutch and German. When it comes to auxiliary verbs, the order in Dutch is auxiliary verb plus infinitive. In German, it's the opposite way around, infinitive plus auxiliary verb. I will illustrate this with an example. This is a television series that one should definitely watch. In Dutch, dit is een televisieserie die men beslist zou moeten kijken. En in German, das is eine TV-serie die man unbedingt anschauen sollte. Note again how in Dutch the correct sentence is moeten kijken and in German it is anschauen sollte. And that wraps up today's lesson. I discussed how the high German consonant shift is the cause of many spelling differences between Dutch and German. After that I went into detail about the difference in spelling and continued with differences in grammar. In conclusion, how similar are Dutch and German really? Without the high German consonant shift, they would be very similar. Because the shift took place, German diverged from Dutch and it's also where most differences in pronunciation and spelling come from. In the future, the difference may become slightly smaller or slightly bigger depending on how both languages evolve. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to hit the like and subscribe button. Your condition is not getting better and you decide to go to the nearby clinic. You receive a medical report. What is the diagnosis? You receive a medical report. What is the diagnosis? The diagnosis is food poisoning caused by contaminated food. Voedselvergiftiging veroorzaakt door besmet voedsel. Most people don't like to hear this, but consistent hard work is one of the biggest factors in your language learning success. 
The course or method you choose makes a difference too, but at the end of the day, you ride or die by the work you put in. The quantity of time spent studying language doesn't necessarily determine the quality of your study. Spending three hours a day watching movies doesn't help you learn much if you're not actively engaging with the language. In this video, we'll talk about three ways to actively engage your mind while studying a new language. Number one, think of your brain as a muscle. You're probably familiar with the phrase, feel the burn, or maybe no pain, no gain. If you've been to your local gym recently, there's a chance you might have heard one of these phrases or seen them plastered on a wall. There's an idea in the world of sports and workouts that the discomfort you feel when running, pumping iron, or doing some other physical activity is what brings results. During a healthy workout, the muscles of the body are affected at a microscopic level. The discomfort you feel is your muscles being pushed to their limit. It's the limit pushing that strengthens your muscles so that over time, your performance increases. In the context of language learning, it's helpful to think of your brain as a muscle. Just as we need to push our physical limits when exercising, we also need to push our mental limits when learning a foreign language. Have you ever studied or practiced your target language in a way that left you tired or even exhausted? If so, you've experienced what it's like to push your brain out of its linguistic comfort zone. Number two, practice active listening. One of the easiest ways to push your language skills is to practice active listening. Active listening is when you listen to someone speaking your target language and you do your best to understand what you hear. The best way to accomplish this is by using audio that you can't completely understand on the first listen. Preferably, you want to use audio that has subtitles or transcripts for you to double check your understanding after you listen to it. You can use movies, YouTube clips, or even our language program, which has very useful transcripts for each lesson. During a practice session, you should listen to the audio several times. The first time around, it's okay if little to no words stick out to you. Simply make a mental note of any words or sounds you recognize. The second time you listen, you're likely to recognize a little more than you did the previous time. Expect similar results with your third or even fourth time listening. After you've hit the ceiling of words you can decipher, go ahead and look at the language subtitles or transcripts. Listen to the audio again, reading along with the text. Odds are that you will see words in the text you know, but didn't hear correctly. You're also likely to encounter words that are new to you completely. As you play back the audio and read along, try to guess what these words mean from the context of the words around them. After you've read along a couple times, feel free to look up the remaining unfamiliar words in a dictionary or translator app. This active listening exercise routine is a great way to increase your listening and comprehension skills while picking up some new vocabulary along the way. It also allows you to learn new words in context, which itself is a powerful method to help you retain what you study. Number three, practicing with native speakers. Practicing with native speakers is the epitome of pushing your language skills. Using what you know to communicate in real time is where the rubber really meets the road. Try to connect with a native speaker on a weekly basis. Regularity is what makes the difference when you're learning a foreign language. If you live in a large metropolitan area, then there's a significant chance that there are some local native speakers nearby. Try hitting up a local language exchange or meetup group to make the necessary connections. If you're unable to find a practice partner locally, then you can take your search online. There are a number of sites out there that help you find and connect with other language learners from around the world. There are tons of language learners around the world who have learned or are learning a second language. You're likely to find someone who knows your target language and is looking to improve their own language skills as well. Learning a new language isn't always easy, but it's the discomfort that comes with pushing your ability in the language that produces results in your studies. Don't be afraid to step outside of your comfort zone. The further away you get from your native language, the closer you'll be to attaining fluency. Also remember that language learning is in every way a lot like an adventure. There will be fun times and times when it feels like you're swimming up the proverbial stream. It's by keeping your head up long enough through these ups and downs that you will experience the priceless satisfaction that comes from learning a foreign language. Just keep moving forward. Let's be honest, it's difficult to learn a new language. If you're new to a language, it's going to take consistent and concentrated effort to start using the language fluently. However, this fact shouldn't discourage you. While learning a new language is hard, it's far from impossible. In this video, we'll outline five tips you can use to jumpstart your language learning. 
Follow these pointers to learn your target language in a way that is efficient and effective. Number one, limit your native language use when practicing. The idea here is that when you practice with native speakers, you do your best to refrain from using your native language. This is generally harder the less you know, but if you can manage to stick to this rule, you'll reap some huge rewards. If you commit to a no native language practice session, it's not going to be easy. Most likely, there will be some frustrating, if not painstakingly difficult moments where you either have trouble understanding the person you're talking to, or you can't say what you want to say. It's precisely in these moments that your language learning muscles are built up to capacity. The process really isn't all that different from working out in the gym. Just replace the physical burn of lifting weights for the mental burn of thinking in a new language. In the end, if there's no pain, there's no gain. Obviously, this no native language rule doesn't have to be written in stone. There are times when it's more beneficial to break out of the target language box and have something explained to you in your native language. However, this should definitely be the exception rather than the standard. Number two, have set times to practice speaking throughout the week. Now that we've discussed a good way to practice speaking, let's delve a bit into when to speak. One of the best commitments you can keep while learning a new language is to set aside specific times to practice speaking the language on a weekly basis. Ideally, these speaking sessions are on set days at specific times and form part of your weekly routine. If you don't make it a point to set aside specific practice times, you run the risk of your language practice falling through the cracks of your busy schedule. I recommend writing down your practice times and hanging it somewhere you can always see it. You could also input the times into your phone and set an alarm. The point is to remind yourself of your commitment every day so that it doesn't fall by the wayside. Number three, get picky about vocabulary. Whether you practice with a podcast, a friend at a coffee shop, or a teacher, you're going to run into a flood of new and unfamiliar vocabulary. Despite your best efforts, it's unlikely that you'll be able to pin down every new word or phrase you hear and study it later. Thus, you should pick and choose which new words you focus on. The defining quality of each new word you learn should be its practicality. The more useful a word or phrase is to you in a conversation, the more important it is that you learn it. Don't feel like you have to cram the entirety of your target language into one week of study. Take it one step at a time. A few practical words here, some more there. Before you know it, you'll see your vocabulary improve. Number four, write and practice short monologues. This tip can be a lot of fun. Begin by selecting a topic you enjoy discussing. Then, simply write out a short monologue or speech on the subject in your target language. The first thing you'll notice while doing this will likely be the holes in your grammar and vocabulary. But when you try to write out your thoughts in a foreign language, you might inevitably hit roadblocks. You might not be able to think of a word or know how to formulate a specific idea or opinion yet. This can be great because these holes are the exact areas where you should focus your studies. You can bring up these problem areas in your next lesson or browse through your favorite language course or textbook in order to find the answer. The constant process of finding these language holes and filling them is what keeps you moving along the path to fluency. Once you finish your short text, it's a great idea to practice reciting it or even memorizing it. The memorization will help you internalize the new grammar and vocabulary you've learned. Reciting it will get your tongue and mouth used to the sounds. Number five, keep an up-to-date list on what you want to learn. Throughout your studies, you should always have a sort of language shopping list. As you practice and study, you will most likely come across things you'd like to be able to say, but don't know how to yet, especially if you follow our previous tip. Write this wish list down. It's one thing to learn the vocabulary you pick up via a course or podcast, both of which are great, it's a bit different when your vocabulary gets personal. Learn the words that matter to you, either because they're practical or because you simply find them interesting. The more relevant the vocabulary, the more likely you are to retain it. Some people might tell you it's impossible to learn a new language for whatever reason, but it's important to remember that the way you study and engage with a language greatly affects how quickly or effectively you learn it. Being able to speak freely with native speakers is an amazing ability in itself. But being able to speak freely to a whole new group of people opens you up to possible new relationships. Most people don't realize that spending the time to build relationships in a foreign language can actually help you improve your language skills dramatically. In this video, we look at how making relationships in a foreign language can help you learn the language faster. 
The benefits of having friends and partners who speak a foreign language. First, it's motivational. One of the greatest struggles for anyone learning a second language is motivation. Nine times out of 10, learners start out their language learning journey with loads of enthusiasm, only to see it gradually wane over time. Try as they may, it's difficult to maintain the spark they once shared with their new language. So why not borrow energy from a different part of your life? When you make relationships with people in your target language, all the excitement of a new relationship carries directly over into your learning. Suddenly, you have a very rewarding reason to improve your skills and keep practicing. As your partner or your friends get involved, you will also have the advantage of a constant source of support and encouragement. Second, it makes language learning practical. Studying vocabulary and grammar is a vital part of language learning, whether you use a podcast, textbook, app, or find yourself in a classroom. However, as great as studying is, a language really only starts to come alive once you start using it in everyday life. There's a huge difference between a scripted conversation in a lesson plan and a real-life conversation with a native speaker. Building relationships with native speakers will give you the chance to talk in your target language often. Furthermore, it will be in a way that feels natural. You'll learn the words in the context, which is hugely important. Third, it's fun. One of the greatest benefits is that it allows you to practice without having it feel like practice. Oftentimes, you'll find yourself so wrapped up in the conversation that you forget you're using a foreign language. This takes a lot of the pressure off and helps you focus on communication over trying to speak absolutely perfectly. You also get to learn about a whole new culture from your partner or friends. So you're not only learning language skills, but also about the cultures that surround your target language. The risks of having friends and partners who speak a foreign language. First, it's easy to miscommunicate. When it comes to relationships, humans can easily misunderstand each other. So it can be hard when building relationships in your target language when you or your partner's lack of ability in each other's respective native tongue can lead to miscommunications that would otherwise be avoidable. Depending on the language you're speaking, a simple mistranslation or mispronounced word can drastically change the meaning of a sentence. As long as you can afford each other some extra patience and the benefit of the doubt, then you should be able to overcome this pitfall. Second, your language skills could suffer if your relationships don't work out. If all your language practice is wrapped up in one person and your relationship with that person doesn't work out, then your language learning could take a big hit. So it's best not to put all your hopes for language growth on one area, relationship or otherwise. You don't want to risk losing motivation, so try to find it in many different areas. An idea for building relationships in a foreign language. Make games out of getting to know one another. Sometimes, opening up in any new friendship or partnership can be hard. Add in the added struggle of a new language and it can feel impossible to share your true feelings with others. So instead of trying to take first interactions so seriously and talking about the usual things like the weather or work, try to ask new, interesting questions. Try to figure out what the other person's hobbies are without asking directly or what kind of job they have. This will give you a chance to stretch your language skills in a new way, and you'll probably get some funny answers out of it too. Being comfortable being silly or making language mistakes is a great way to bond with someone, even if you've just met. Relationships in a foreign language have a lot more benefits to offer than drawbacks. Don't be scared to open up to people and make mistakes. Hey everyone, welcome to The Monthly Review, the monthly show on language learning. How to finally learn language in 2020, your New Year's resolution solution. Today, you're going to learn one, three reasons most goals fail, two, the three rules for successful goal setting, and three, we're going to set you up with your first language goal for 2020. So, if you've failed with your goals or New Year's resolutions before, then this lesson is for you. You'll be able to finally learn your target language, make measurable progress, and reach every goal you set. But first, listen up. Here are this month's new lessons and resources. First, the making a phone call cheat sheet. Want to be able to talk on the phone in your target language? Then this conversation cheat sheet will help you do just that. You'll learn all the basic phrases, questions, and answers you'll need when making a phone call. Second, want to know the learning hacks, motivational tips, and success strategies for learning a language in 2020? Then you'll want this exclusive 52-page ebook. Download it now for free before we take it down. 
Third, words and phrases for the dentist. Learn how to schedule a checkup, talk about a toothache, and much more with this one-minute vocab lesson. Fourth, can you talk about your zodiac sign? If not, then this next one-minute lesson is for you. You'll learn how to say the 12 signs in your target language. Fifth, the 32 words you need for language learning. Noun, verb, adjective, sentence, grammar. Can you say these in your target language? If not, you'll want this quick one-minute lesson. To get your free resources, click the link in the description below right now. They're yours to keep forever. Okay, let's jump into today's topic. How to finally learn language in 2020, your New Year's resolution solution. So, January is over, but let me ask you a question. Have you set a resolution for this year? If you haven't, it's understandable. Most people end up failing with their resolutions. You set one, you try to do it in January, and by February, there's no progress. Doing it is no longer fun, or you get sidelined by something else. So you quit and put it off until next year, or whenever the guilt of quitting your goals comes back to haunt you. So, what's the problem with setting resolutions? Why do we keep failing? First of all, regardless of what most people say about New Year's resolutions, setting goals, whether on January 1st or any other time of the year, is a good thing. You have to know where you're going and what you want to achieve. Otherwise, you'll be floating around aimlessly from one language app to another and have nothing to show for your time spent. But the problem lies with the goals that people set. For example, most people set goals like, I want to master Chinese, or I want to lose weight, or I want to be fluent in Japanese. And based on these kinds of goals, here are three reasons why 90% of New Year's resolutions fail. First, resolutions fail because they are not specific and not measurable. Take a goal like, I want to master Chinese this year. The problem is that's a very vague goal. What do you mean by master? Do you want to speak about the economy or do you just want to have everyday conversations? And can you really measure how much progress you need to master the language? The second reason is, they are unrealistic. You might think, but isn't it good to set huge goals and aim for the stars? It's not bad, but if you say, I want to be fluent by September, is that realistic for you? Are you ready to commit yourself to nothing but language learning, six to eight hours a day, nonstop? The answer is no for most people. The third one is, there's no action plan. The problem is, you'll still fail even with a specific and realistic goal if you don't know when and how you're going to do it. For example, when will you study? How long will you study every day? And how will you study? So now you know why most people fail with their New Year's resolutions. Then how do we set New Year's resolutions and actually succeed? Here are the three rules for successful goal setting. Remember, your goals must be one, specific and measurable, two, realistic, and three, they must have an action plan. Yes, the complete opposite of everything you heard earlier. For example, let's say you're learning Italian this year. Instead of saying, my goal is to learn Italian this year, set a specific, measurable, realistic goal for the month, like speak three minutes of conversation by February 28th. And you can also set a yearly goal, like 30 minutes of conversation, and work towards that. The whole point is, three minutes is measurable. You set a timer, time yourself, and know when you reach it. It's realistic. Instead of saying, I want to learn the whole language, you're just aiming for three minutes for the month and maybe 30 minutes for the year. So ask yourself, do I have time to learn enough of the language to speak for three minutes? That will vary from learner to learner. But three minutes sounds much more realistic than I want to master a language. Finally, you still need an action plan for your goal. And for that, you need to answer these questions. When will you study? How long will you study every day? Where do you plan to study? How will you study? What is your study schedule? This is the most important part because this tells you when and how to study. If you don't answer these questions, you'll have no idea what to do and you'll quit because you have no routine to stick to. So for example, when will you study? I'll study at 9 p.m. on weekdays. How long will you study every day? I'll study for 20 minutes. Where do you plan to study? I'll study at home, in the living room, on my computer. How will you study? I'll listen to one audio lesson a day for five days. What is your study schedule? From Monday to Friday with audio lessons. I'll listen to the lesson, then go through the lesson notes for 20 minutes each day. Here are a few more things you can do to improve your chances of success. Reward yourself after hitting a goal. 
Studies have shown that giving yourself a reward after reaching a goal is crucial to creating lasting habits and continuing to conquer more goals. Write down your small, measurable goal and put it somewhere you'll see it often. Now that you know why New Year's resolutions fail and you know what to do differently, it's time to set your goal. So thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. See you next time. Bye. Great work. Here's a reward. Speed up your language learning with our PDF lessons. Get all of our best PDF cheat sheets and eBooks for free. Just click the link in the description.